Um, Christoph gave us uh, spectacular introductions, which I, I love, especially because he said nice things. But the reason he did it is that I gave him candy, and that inspired him to be nice. And if you're nice to him, he'll be give you a piece of maple candy from Vermont. I brought it all the way for you all. Christoph uh, insists that I'm an environmental historian, and I love to hear it. I, I'd like to admit it's true, but I'm not sure. Uh, certainly not in a technical uh, sense. And there, in the United States, some terrific men and women who are doing environmental history. But I have an interest, as he says, in the land and how people related to the land o over time, the conversation between humans and uh, their environment. So although my, my claim to be an environmental historian may be a little tenuous, nevertheless, I come to you as a historian, uh, and I want to tell you a story today. That's what historians do. About three groups in America that had different, often conflicting visions for developing the forests of northern New England and northern New York during the decade of the 1790s. One group dreamed of reforming the world, of making it a more equitable place, of bringing fairness to other humans. Another group had only eyes for corporate profit. And the third group simply wanted to guarantee its own personal independence in a new Republican society that spoke of economic opportunity for ordinary white citizens. There are no obvious villains in my tale. As with so many conversations that go on in public about the environment, all three of these groups, as you will see, could justify what they were doing, what they did do, in terms of morality, economics, and science. The story starts, as it still does in the 21st century in my little town of Greensboro, Vermont, on the first warm days of March. In Vermont, there's still snow on the ground. And the air can be very, very cold, but one senses that the sun is going to bring warmth. There's a feeling that winter is breaking. And this is the time when the sap of the maple trees begin to run. That is, as you all know, an Acer saccharum, sugar maple. To make sugar, one needs a number of these trees. And when they grow together in a group, which all of us wish we had, it's called a sugar bush. And the liquid that comes pouring from holes drilled in these mature trees is initially watery, and it is repeatedly collected over and over, night and day, tree to tree, even on the coldest of <coughs> nights. Oops, there you go. There's a collecting bucket. The producers in the 1790s assumed that, I'm quoting from a guy, that an ordinary tree uh, yields in a good season from 20 to 30 gallons of sap, that's each tree, which then yields about five or six pounds of sugar eventually. And for several weeks, night and day, the labor of making maple syrup is intensive. The sap must be carried get this right, carried, often on sleds through the snow to the boiling house where the liquid is reduced in metal pans over a wood fire. The process takes hours and the material must be watched carefully. You can never, never leave it or go out for coffee because even a smallest chance of a flame licking over the edge of the pan spoils the whole batch because then the sugar tastes of smoke or of a burnt uh, taste. And a key moment comes in the process. This is, these are boiling houses where the, the collected syrup comes. You can see the, the moisture from the sap being boiled down. And here's a, an older sort of courier in Ives. Uh, uh, the key moment comes when a local expert, who is usually known both in the Caribbean and in northern New England as the striker, 
puts his finger in the hot liquid and pulls it up. And if he gets a string of the right viscosity, he knows it's ready and you yield a wonderful, thick, amber, sugary um, substance. Now, people in Vermont didn't invent maple syrup. The Native Americans knew as far back in time about the production of this. And the New Englanders, when they first came in the 17th century, the Puritans, they too knew about maple syrup. It wasn't a new process in 1790. But enthusiasm for this product changed dramatically, suddenly, in the 1790s, because new concerns, political and social, triggered what was a massive, new, unprecedented demand for maple syrup. And the transformation was focused in two of the largest cities of the new republic, New York City and Philadelphia. People living in these cities, many of them Quakers, many of them Quakers, were horrified by reports coming out of the Caribbean about human suffering connected with the production of cane sugar, sugar cane. And anti-slave associations in the United States, and there were quite a few of them at the time, were extremely frustrated. After all, the founding fathers, when they drafted the Constitution of the United States, did not address the scourge of slavery. They let that lie for another time. But the reformers in New York and in Philadelphia thought that the moment had come when slavery in the Caribbean at least could be addressed. And they imagined a great moral boycott that in the fullness of time might bring the planters, the evil planters to their knees and free the slaves in um, the Caribbean that suffered like this. And they were passionately committed to the cause. One promoter insisted that maple sugar does not, and here's the quote, require the lash of cruelty on our fellow creatures. And other reformers argued that if Americans would only agree to sweeten their coffee with some substitute, they would thereby diminish so many strokes of the whip which draw, which are luxury, which are luxury, draws upon the black people. A New York newspaper, a na major journal in 1790, even ran a bizarre conversation that they said allegedly had occurred between a bee, like an insect, and a black slave in the crib. I, there's no record of what language they used for this conversation. But the bee comes down and asks the bondsman, <clears throat> do you enjoy working in the fields? Which is, of course, a stupid question. You can figure that one out. <laughs> to which the black reply answered, no, the work really is terrible. It's really awful. And then the clueless bee inquires, well, then why do you engage in all these painful tasks? To which the slave answers, and this is what the slaves say, so that the whites may obtain a sweet drug for their friends beyond the sea. And a sweet drug. The remedy, of course, as you figure it out, was none other than maple sugar, produced by freeholders, independent Republican landholders, Jefferson and Gregory, who would have no need for slave labor. These farmers of the North could engage in making sweetness, and this is another wonderful quotation, making sweetness enhanced by the reflection that it is not stained with the sweat and blood of Negro slaves. New sugar. There were other arguments, of course, advanced in favor of the new product. After all, it was made in the U.S. of A. That meant that any production of maple syrup would keep our money in our country and not flowing to Britain or France or whoever owned those various Caribbean islands. So using maple syrup in your house for your coffee was the fulfillment of the American Revolution, of an independent economy 
coming into its own. And more, bizarrely, I think, people told each other in New York and Philadelphia that maple syrup was cleaner. It was more sanitary than the sugar cane that came from the Caribbean. The leading scientist of America in that day, Dr. Benjamin Rush, who was a, a pal of Thomas Jefferson, wrote this, I shall say nothing here of the hands which are employed in making sugar in the West Indies, but this, men who work for the exclusive benefit of others are not under the same obligations to keep their persons clean when they are employed in this work than men, women, and children who are exclusively working for their own benefit and who have been educated in this country to the habit of cleanliness. So, I mean, what the hell? You get maple syrup and there's no bad things to worry about eating. So it was a win-win proposition. Americans could consume their sweets with the consoling knowledge that it was made by free, independent, Republican families who did not spend their hard-earned money enriching foreign rivals. And in the bargain, they could have a sanitary sweetener and free the slaves. What more could you ask? And that's what was in the papers in these cities. But there's more. The people that pushed the maple syrup project guaranteed that it could not fail. There's no, no risk. The forests of America were filled with these wonderful sugar maples. And anyone could go walk in the woods and see that. And so the social reformers, the people that wanted to free the slaves of the Caribbean, insisted that American production required no special knowledge, no particular skill. After all, all you had to do was go into the woods, drill a hole in the tree, collect the, the stuff that comes out, have a big kettle and boil it down, and you had a new source of income. I mean, this is also good in America. If you use the right sweetener, freedom and prosperity could go together. Now enter the second group in my story. <clears throat> the United States in the 1790s may have achieved or bragged of political independence. We got rid of the Brits, but in fact, the country was still hugely dependent on external capital investments. Indeed, indeed, some historians think it wasn't until the presidency of Andrew Jackson that uh, capital came from domestic sources sufficient to uh, support industry. British, Dutch capital. And during the 1790s, one of the most aggressive enterprises was the Holland Land Company. The company was not really a company in the way I ordinarily think about corporations. It was rather a kind of collective association of risk capital people, kind of hedge fund guys. And they would put their money together and look for specific investment projects that look good. These Dutchmen were savvy, they were experienced, and they were absolutely certain in the 1790s that the United States was the place to put your money. I mean, Deja vu all goes around. As the name implies, the Holland Land Company, and their first goal was to buy huge tracts of undeveloped land, which they thought they could, over time, as speculators, sell them in smaller pieces to these uh, American farmers. Uh, they took over huge, or they purchased huge amounts of land, as I'll show you later, that were, of course, only recently owned by the Iroquois tribes and other Native American groups, but that didn't seem to slow down the process. What you need to know is land, ownership of land in the 1790s was what petroleum is to our society. And speculation in land was viewed as an appealing, though risky, source of return on your investment. And not surprisingly, the sudden 
urban American interest in maple sugar caught the attention of the leaders of the Holland Land Company. Here, in New York, in Philadelphia, was a new market. There was a new consumer demand that had to be addressed. All that one had to do was figure out how to produce this substitute sweetener on an industrial scale, and the directors of the company and all their stockholders would become fabulously wealthy, sweet wealth. The trees were there for taking, opportunity knocked, and I might add, in passing, there is absolutely no evidence that anyone in the Holland Land Company had the least concern about slavery in the Caribbean. Indeed, there's even some evidence that some of the partners were supplying slaves to the Caribbean. No matter. It's a new business. If Americans living in the major cities wanted maple syrup, they'd have it. It was easy. Listen to one glowing economic report that reached the desks of these Dutch investors. The states of New York and Pennsylvania have a sufficient number of this kind of tree to supply the whole United States with sugar. It is moreover other things in its favor that are recommended in favor of or over the West Indian product. It is made by the hands of freemen and at a season of the year in America when not one single insect exists to pollute our sugar. So there's always this kind of sanitation thing. Yeah. Not only do we make it, but not even our insects mess, mess with our product. Secrecy for the company was vital. After all, if competitors, other Dutch companies, uh, learned of the Holland Land Company's proposal to buy huge, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of acres. This is not just your little farm in Vermont. Well, if that happened, then the, the cost of investment would rise, so they wanted to have seek. And speed was essential, too. Because no one uh, could predict how long the demand for maple syrup would be there. You have to respond when the market uh, speaks. And the person selected by the Holland Land Company for this delicate mission was a man by the name of John Lincoln, a man born in 1768 in Holland and later educated in Switzerland. He seems to have been a person of great energy, certainly unquestioned loyalty to his superiors in the company. In any case, Lincoln dispatched, was dispatched to New York with orders to investigate secretly all the most promising areas for maple sugar. He was smart. He was clearly <clears throat> learning on his job and his diary, I came across something that would have been unsettling, I suppose, if the company had known. But when this Dutchman arrived, he actually couldn't identify a sugar maple. And he had to um, interrogate an American farmer, and he confesses in his diary, I learned tonight there are two kinds of maple trees. The one yielding sap, which has a leaf that is a soft green color. The other tree has no sap and has a leaf, a leaf of a deeper green, but the underside of the leaf seems to be pale blue. Well, then if you want, that's not very good advice <laughs> for finding maple trees. Uh, but he was not discouraged. He organized several uh, trips throughout north, uh, eastern Pennsylvania and uh, in New York into a huge region, if you know your geography, where the city of Buffalo and Utica are now located, a, a great swatch of land. But we know most about a trip he took in the fall of 1791. We know most because his diary that he and a colleague, a man named Boone, uh, Kept. And they went up to Vermont, which was then the 14th state of the United States. It just had been admitted. And what Lincoln found shocked him. When he reached southern Vermont, 
1791, this is the third year of Washington's first term, just to put it in perspective, he not only could find no maple trees, there were no trees at all. They'd all been cut down. Thousands of settlers had recently pushed up from Connecticut and Massachusetts and established small, what we call in America, hard scrabble farms. And drawing on their experience with mixed animal husbandry, they sought to create immediately open passenger, pasture uh, where grass could be grown to feed their cows. That's what farmers did. They fed their cows grass. And these people that Lincoln met had an almost adversarial relation to trees. They hated trees. Trees were the enemy, and they saw no reason to spare the maple tree over any other tree. Trees had to be gone. And from the farmer's point of view, cutting the trees gave you fuel for the winter. It gave you building material for your cabin. Uh, this was a picture of New York in 1791, giving you a sense that uh, it was a somewhat cosmopolitan. This was the center for actually anti-slavery. Few people realized that three people formed the first, um, what it was called, the Negro Reading Room in New York, and they were Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and Benjamin Franklin. So, and still those books, that's a wonderful institution. But here, I, I got this chart. You can see that in the earliest times, 1850, 75% of Vermont had been cleared timbers, entirely in agriculture. By 1983, it's almost reversed. So if you go to Vermont, if you go to Upper New York today as a, as a tourist, which I highly advise, and you look at it and say, oh, the tree is so, so beautiful. That's a new environment you're looking at. These are actually the trees you see are called third growth trees. And um, in any case, Lincoln got up there, there were, there were no, no trees. And he had to write back to the company, let me read uh, a letter. There are in Vermont maple trees, but generally people cannot be persuaded from the advantage they might get from these trees. In the southern part of the state, where the settlements are older, the land is cleared. People have cut down almost all the trees. And to the north, where there's more forest, these trees are no more prized than they are in the south. And when he asked farmers, well, why don't you see that this maple syrup is gold is going to transform your life? He was told, well, look, have you ever seen that the specific gravity a maple syrup is, is extremely heavy. It's a, hard to transport. And since there are no rivers in Vermont that flow east to west, it was damn hard to get it to Lake Champlain and ever reach that New York market where they're apparently eager to have the new sugar. Moreover, as the company discovered, getting the tools necessary for this process was much more expensive and harder than they had bargained for. You need kettles, you need a certain metal goods. And so most of the farmers said, look, it's just not worth the risk of our personal investment to make this um, sugar. And more quickly, I'm looking at my little watch here. You, do you have something like a, a crook that will pull me away? <laughs> Lincoln, Lincoln found that in fact the farmers looked at the land the same way his company did. It was just a matter of scale. The company wanted 100,000 acres. The individual Vermont farmers had 10 acres, but they had the same mentality. Land was a commodity. And so the Dutchman reports to his company, it is astonishing to me to see a man 50 years old who spent the better part of his life cleaning his land and enhancing its value and then leaving it all just as he begins to enjoy the fruits of his labor in order to bury himself again in the dark forest and expose himself to all the difficulties of finding a new settlement. 
These are the people that cut down the trees. Everywhere he met poor Americans who were willing to work really hard for eight or ten years clearing pasture and then getting back to the diary, selling out at a higher price so that they gain a sum or to buy more land, enough to maintain and establish around them a dozen children. Apparently that was a good thing to the Dutch. You sell, you work, you speculate. Well, it was obviously too late for the Holland Land Company to buy Vermont. Uh, but the northern woods of New York beckoned. And this is the huge area around Lake Erie, where if any go between Buffalo and Rochester, that whole area in the New York interstate, if you drive, drive around in America, that they bought up a huge amounts of land, mostly to be sure, to sell eventually. But the company was doggedly insistent that it would not give up on maple syrup. Somehow, some way, it would be, be manufactured at a industrial level. When I say industrial, I mean enough to supply ordinary users. Now the Dutch were very smart businessmen. They realized something that sugar makers in my neighborhood have been slow to come to even in the 21st century. And that is the problem with making maple syrup efficiency, efficiently is not the trees, it's the labor, it's the collecting of the, of the, of the sap over and over. It's so intensive and it takes a lot of workers who then would become unemployed when the process is, is done. And so the Dutch set up what was arguably the first agricultural experiment station in New York and decided that they would solve the maple syrup problem. They built little troughs that were in little like V troughs where water would run down the sap. They had trees that they hollowed out so they looked like straws and they were connected from one tree to another. Nothing worked. Every time there was a a frost or a sudden freeze, the pipes broke, the troughs came undone, and all the sap spilled onto the ground. What they needed, of course, was plastic. <laughs> that was not on offer in the late 18th century. And so the, the, the whole experiment in time uh, uh, came to nothing. And the, farm, and the company sold uh, land to the farmers who were only marginally interested in the maple syrup project. This, this is, if you ever go up to you, uh, Batavia, New York, good Dutch name, but uh, that's the, the last physical <coughs> sign of the Holland Land Company where they doled out pieces of land in the 1820s and 1830s. Ironically, as I found, some New York sugar reached Philadelphia. Some of it made to the market, but it was reportedly very dirty and water damaged. Indeed, it looked suspiciously like the product that we had condemned in the Caribbean. So be it. The third group in our story are, of course, those settler speculators. And it's easy in most stories about the environment to blame them, to condemn them for cleaning the forest in a mindless, exploitative way, as you see here, claiming these Vermont lands. But I would argue that that would be an over-hasty reaction. For in point of fact, the independent agriculturalists, as you see here, often justify their actions by pointing to the latest scientific evidence. I point to you, Samuel Williams, Samuel Williams, who wrote the first great history, really an environmental history of Vermont in the year 1791. And he explained to these people that the forests, when you have forests, they're too moist for good health. And he advised the farmers to cut down all the trees to bring in the sunlight and dry the soil. He spoke to the people a voice of enlightened science. 
open pastures are good for cows. Sunlight is good for people. Cut the trees. Now, today, everyone in this room realizes that cutting trees leads to erosions of silting streams, of changing the landscape in ways that we find undesirable. But that was not the terms of the conversation in 1790. These people, in George Barson's presidency, felt the less trees, the more civilized, and the more scientific America would be. And so the story ends. Those consumers who called for the end of Caribbean slavery turned their attention to other matters. And I can say that the whole maple syrup project had absolutely no impact on the life of slaves in the Caribbean. Nothing. By the 1830s, the Holland Land Company decided that it had enough, and it sold off, as I say, all of its holding to fresh waves of farmers who saw this land. And if you go to New York today, you see these wonderful dairy farms. It's an extremely prosperous area. <coughs> and only slowly, at least in Vermont, did the trees return. Maple syrup is now not a savior for slaves, but a treat for tourists. It's a memento of a trip that one's family takes to the great northern forest. The majestic trees that once promised to end a great human evil. Come on. Come on. Well, what you would have seen is a picture of candy in a store in Vermont. Thank you.